It's the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, wrestling fans. I'm your host, Hall of Fame wrestling writer, broadcaster, and announcer, Jason Bryant. And I am back to the U.S., back to the U.S., back to you know, the, just the U.S. of A. After about a week in Guatemala at the Pan Am Championships, Team USA lit it up, brought home a lot of medals. Men's freestyle didn't lose about. Women did really, really well, and so did Greco. So I know that the Cubans weren't there. You know the Cubans weren't there, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the team won more gold medals on the men's freestyle side than they gave up points. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to rehash the breakdowns from the Pan Am Championships, but if you did miss anything, you can go back and hear yours truly on the call, which was here in the States on Flow Wrestling. So it was great to be back on the road. It was great to be traveling. Guatemala, I just want to touch on this for a little bit. Francisco Lee is like the rich bender of Guatemala. They had about six weeks to put this thing together because originally UWW had it scheduled for Rio de Janeiro, and they had some COVID issues down there. They moved it to Guatemala. It had shifted like three or four different times. Ultimately, Guatemala City and the, uh, let's see if I can say this right, if I can remember, Gimnasio Teodoro Palacios Flores. Yes, they were the host facility. And transportation was great. Food was great. People were great. Uh, I, I learned that my Spanish from three years in high school was woefully inadequate, but my Spanglish passed for a couple different things. I actually did understand certain things, and I actually have to call back my Pocosin High education with Miss Britt, Miss Stoldorf, and Mr. Fay in teaching me some of the basic nuances and, and basically just phrases. Like, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, Darmi and Papalito. Uh, that means, like, give me the, the prize or ticket or something. That was dinner every day. I know my friend Billy back home in Pocosin would be like, no, Senor Fay, Darmi and Papalito, ahora, rapidamente. Yeah, so I'm using some things out there. I had some fun with it. It was great to be back on the mic again. It had been a while since I had done a broadcast, especially internationally, but a lot of medallias de oro. Yes, gold medals for Team USA. Speaking of Team USA and gold medals, you can be a gold medal team member here at Matt Talk Online by joining the team. Go to matttalkonline.com slash contribute. That will give you options to contribute to this network. Or again, you click that Patreon link. You can be a team member. You get some cool gear. You get Oh, I don't know, those nice 20-ounce draft glasses that fit that tall boy of your craft lager just so perfectly. You got some new shirts that are going to come down the pipe from Compound soon. Austin Early, the latest team member, he has jumped in actually just as we record this. So a lot of good things to support the network. The Fargo Almanac is updated for 2020. FargoAlmanac.com. $20, you buy it once. It is a digital product. When I say you buy it once, you buy it once you get free updates annually. I'm not going to charge you 20 bucks a year just to update the results from, from Flow Arena and put them in there and sort them out. Now, I could, but I'm not going to. You get a free update for life, FargoAlmanac.com. You also get that for free or as part of a perk if you join the Matt Talk Online team at Patreon.com slash Matt Talk Online or Matt Talk Online.com slash contribute. You can find that there. So that's just a perk. And Austin, for example, he got sent that link today for the 2021 Almanac because Fargo, the 50th Junior National Tournament, next year will be the 50th Greco Tournament, and next year will also be the 20th Junior Women's Tournament. So we've had that fan bracket that came out, which Pat Smith won. Uh, it probably should have been Alan Freed or Sean Haig, but there was that's whatever. Fans vote, fans vote. You know what you like. Speaking of Pat Smith and Oklahomans, we've got one on the show today. This is episode four of the Dan Hodge Tribute Series. And for those of you that followed any semblance of professional wrestling at any point in your life, the term mark uh, essentially means you know it's a fan, somebody who's going to watch it as if, almost as if uh, pro wrestling was was not what it is as far as it's it's theatrics and its soap opera-esque nature. It is still entertaining. I don't care how old you are. If you grew up with it, I found myself watching like Survivor Series 1990 today in The Undertaker's debut. Seriously. Sometimes I'll get down these rabbit holes. I'll watch The Ultimate Warrior in SummerSlam 88 beating the Honky Tonk Man probably once a month. It's one of my favorite pro wrestling matches of all time. So yes, there is a professional wrestling theme to this, but today it's old JR. Jim Ross, the voice of professional wrestling throughout pretty much my childhood, whether it be his time from the WWF turned WWE or in Crockett Country with World Championship Wrestling. Jim Ross, unabashedly and unbiasedly, actually, no, he's completely biased in this regard for his love and admiration for the late, great Danny Hodge. And part of this Dan Hodge tribute series, we've talked to Mike Chapman, we've talked to Leroy Smith, we've talked to Jerry Briscoe. We're going to finish up with Jack Roller after this, after we get through Hall of Fame Honors Weekend, which is coming up in Stillwater. 
uh, this weekend as we record this on June the 3rd. But Jim Ross has a view of Dan Hodge that is more from a professional wrestling angle. But again, the personal story is that this ties really, really well together with the previous episode with Jerry Briscoe. But the opportunity to to get Jim Ross on the record, he's talked about it on Conrad Thompson's show, but we're, we're a couple months removed from, from Danny's passing. And going back and listening to the show again, this is something that if, if, if you don't even watch any professional wrestling sports entertainment today, and you did at one point in your life, especially during the Jim Ross era. You know, he's still it's still still Jim Ross era, by the way. He's doing AEW, as he he will mention. But it, it was just to sit back and, and hear the voice of that you heard on TV growing up so much tell stories about a guy that's got this iconic feature in our world of wrestling. It's just really cool. So I'd like to thank everybody that's had a chance to be a part of this. And as we head to Jim Ross again, I'd always like to thank you for spending your time with me because you've always got time for short times. So and now, Dan Hodge Tribute Series continues on with old JR here on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. Tell me the first time you remember hearing about Danny Hodge. I was probably uh, in elementary school because Danny was uh, very prominent on Leroy McGurk's championship wrestling TV show over there throughout this area. So every pretty much every Saturday afternoon, the wrestling show did air, and more often than not, it aired with uh, Danny uh, in a significant role because he was more often than not the NWA Junior Heavyweight Champion. So he became a regular on my television. I met him for the first time in person in uh, 1974. Uh, I was called by McGurk that you know you're going to you're going to Shreveport to do uh, to, to take the TV show, et cetera, et cetera. And I need you to take a guy with you who wants to ride. I didn't even ask who it was. I was just new, 22 years old, didn't ask any questions. So I was, I met at the office, uh, at the, uh, which was at the Tulsa Assembly Center, the, the old Assembly Center there downtown. And uh, there stood Danny Hodge. Growing up, my two big sports heroes were Danny Hodge and Mickey Mantle. So uh, Danny and I met for the first time in 1974. We drove, uh, I drove him to Shreveport, which was about a five hour trip. And uh, that was our first uh, encounter together. And then after that, because I was starstruck and I was uh, more than willing to do my share of the work, I drove Danny a lot. So he didn't like to drive. Uh, he had a, you know, he had a routine. He'd do. He always acted like he was falling asleep, pull off, easy, pull off to the side of the road a little bit all the gravel would start hitting the car like he was weaving and of course you know if you're a passenger you're unsettled now that he's going to fall asleep and kill you so uh, i did most of the driving so that was my first uh, foray with with dan when we look talk about that car ride i mean you, you say he was one of your heroes growing up how do you have a how do you start a conversation with somebody that's that you've had had held in such high regard for your for your life well i just tried not to answer ask too many silly questions like a you know, I was a fan, and I didn't want to be perceived as, you know, a little fanboyish. What the irony of that was is that uh, Danny was reading some book, and he read the book for the whole five hours. We chat, we chatted here, there, and yon. You know, he let you know when he needed a milkshake because he had a sweet tooth that was almost as strong as his grip. So when he needed a milkshake, uh, he we I found a place to get him a milkshake. So that was pretty simple. The bottom line is having a long conversation. It just didn't happen. You know, he was just getting back from Japan. He was tired. He was jet lagged. Uh, and so he was reading this book that he had started, I guess, on his trip and uh, was continuing to, to finish it when uh, we were driving. But, you know, with, with small talk, you know, we talked about the Sooners and, and going to him, Danny being a proud Oklahoma alumnus all that good stuff, me being a big fan of OU football, especially. So uh, it was it was a pretty uh, mundane, not overwhelmingly exciting drive, but it started, it, it launched, I think, uh, our relationship because, you know, he was, he was just uh, so good with me. Uh, he liked me. It was a Eastern Oklahoma country boy, uh, grew up on a farm, 
grew up idolizing him. And so he he kind of became my, uh, oh gosh, I guess guardian angel. Wrestlers are different most days. A lot of guys are uh, bullies and, and uh, not real good quality of people. Some, a lot of them were, don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of them that were a little bit devilish to deal with. But uh, anytime some wrestler wanted to take advantage of me in the ring because I was a referee, and I'd never done that before either, Danny was would intervene if necessary. It only happened once or twice, but he was uh, he was always there for me. And when the boys knew, the wrestlers knew that Danny was my guy because of his reputation and who he was, there was no more issues. So he, he had that much respect in the locker room with everybody. You talk about you know watching him as a kid and, and, and Leroy McGurk's promotions and such, but wrestling is that's a big thing in Oklahoma. Of course, you know Oklahoma A and M, then Oklahoma State, and, and and OU had you know Bedlam was born out of wrestling. And h- how aware were you of OU and Oklahoma State's collegiate wrestling prowess prior to becoming a professional wrestling fan? Well, it's better today, but uh, I think it's not as good as it should be as far as media coverage of amateur wrestling. Uh, college wrestling, it just this is not there. In those days, you know, uh, for example, OU would wrestle in the Lloyd Noble Arena, which is where they play basketball. And, it, you know, seated probably, I'm going to guess somewhere in the neighborhood, 10,000. And they had a lot of full houses. Then the, the tennis has dropped off to where they're, and so recently they're back wrestling in the old McCaston Fieldhouse, which is about, I think, around 3,000. But uh, back in those days, it's, specific to answer your question, uh, the the daily papers in Oklahoma City and in Tulsa were big in covering amateur wrestling. High school, college, JUCO, the whole nine yards. It had a, it had a different respect threshold, it seems to me, like then. And now it's, you know, it's, I don't know if it's not cool. I don't, I don't know what the reasons are. You know, I know that when you only have, when you're biggest, if you only have one event a year, that's televised in a grand way, and that being the Nationals, uh, it doesn't seem like it's enough. So uh, that's just me, and you know, I think I've always thought the the product in general was somewhat uh, under marketed, under promoted. It could be so much bigger, so much better. It's a hard hunt to get over. But in those days, uh, uh, the, the newspapers covered wrestling prominently. And when I was a real young guy, uh, you know, the legend of Danny Hodge from the two Olympic trips, you know, winning the national three times, you know, never losing. It, it just, that was a, a mantra, you know, that just seemed to grow uh, on odds. His legend became bigger and bigger. Danny, I always believe, was much like Jim Thorpe, another native Oklahoman who has never gotten the it's just due. People talk about the greatest athlete of all time. Here's you got a guy that played. NFL football, he played, he played Major League Baseball. He, he resurrected a small college uh, Indian school, Carlisle University in Pennsylvania, to becoming a, a, a competitive with armies and, and all the big, big time schools because of Jim Thorpe and his band of brothers, so to speak. And I think Danny kind of fits in that category. I just look at it where I believe that it's because uh, people, people just felt leery and a little bit gun shy of hanging their hat on anything that to resemble pro wrestling and uh, considering how pro wrestling has evolved and, and become a major entity as far as the television product is concerned, uh, that's changed a little bit, thank goodness. So uh, it's, all good. You know, it's all good in that regard, but uh, I think Danny was one of those guys that was kind of lost in that, that shuffle. You know, he was, I, I don't know how you could have, a, he, he was a great, to me, Denny Hodge was the greatest in his sport that uh, our state has ever produced. And I know it's argumentative and very subjective, but, uh, you know, how, how many better rest, amateur wrestlers are there than Dan Hodge? Well, you know, everybody's about Gable and Sanderson and all, and I'm not going to argue that at all. Those guys are marvelous. But you got to really con- figure out how you're going to convince me that to put anybody above Hodge. Hence, I think that's why the Dan Hodge Wars exists and, and we know what that stands for, the best wrestler in the, in the amateur wrestling. So that's kind of the story there with Danny. Danny was just such a good hearted. And thank God he was because he had the ability to, to go hand, have hand to hand combat with anybody. And nobody wanted that. 
I've never seen a pro wrestler in my in all these years that could handle Dan. Anybody. Brock, I hired Brock Lesnar. He's a bad dude. But he ain't Dan Hodges. He ain't Dan Hodges Universe. Kurt Angle want to go metal. He ain't Dan Hodges Universe either. So, uh, and the guys that are on the inside that know, they would have totally agree. And I'm not knocking those dudes. It's just the fact that Hodges is a, a, a stratosphere all along in my world. You'd mentioned the, you know, kind of the association with pro wrestling. And it seems like going back and watching some footage and doing some research on, on Dan Hodge in that era, uh, I, I'd almost kind of compare it to the, the uh, you know, I guess the the relationship up here in Minnesota when Vern has the AWA, whereas he was yeah. he was taking the, the gopher wrestlers, the North Dakota State wrestlers, the 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 guys that had bona fide collegiate wrestling chops and putting them into the business. And there wasn't that ire from the amateur wrestling community towards professional wrestling because it was part of, of their sporting world. It seems like, uh, is that kind of the case in Oklahoma in that era where if you're a Sooner or a Cowboy or you know a Bronco coming off the uh, the college mats and you're out there for Leroy McGurk or you're, you're working the territories that you, you've got bona fide wrestling chops, the fans are like, yeah, this, this guy's a legitimate tough guy. I guess the curtain wasn't peeled back as much back then, but I think you know where I'm going with this. It, it, it just gave the promoters, like Byrne, it was also a great amateur, as you know better than I, uh, it, gave, uh, the, it gave the sports writers a more palatable reason to, to promote the pro wrestling genre because they had some amateurs in there that were now trying to earn a living using their athletic abilities and their basic fundamental wrestling skills, add a little showmanship, a little sizzle to their stake, and they, they could go out there and make a good living. I, uh, that was kind of, that's kind of how I looked at it. And McGurk did a great job. Leroy was, you know, a great amateur to home state. But he, he broke in Cowboy Bill Watts. He broke in the Briscoe brothers. Chad Briscoe made me the slickest, most technically sound uh, amateur turn pro that I've ever seen. The only guy that even came close to matching his, his transition was Kurt Angle. He just took it up naturally. But we're talking about all those guys. We're not, still not talking about Danny. <laughs> Danny's, still, Danny's still by himself. I asked Luke Pass one time, who was a noted shooter, a hooker. He wrote a book, a hook, a book called uh, Hooker or something like that. Really good. But when you go to these territories, a lot of these wrestlers would try you on for size and see if they could beat you. For, for real. Happened all the time. Because they knew that somehow, some way, by hook or crook, they could beat Lou Thess and become the NWA World Champion. They had to be booked. They had to be paid, and they and they increased their option to make a lot more money. Uh, and beating Lou Thess for the championship in that era in an unheard un, unheard of environment was was big a big deal. So, you know, Lou Lou's go to by the way was a double wrist lock. If he, he Lou got in trouble. He would navigate his way into a double wrist lock, and then he has it. And of course, that's better than the biggest for the MMA tournament, Kimura. Very similar. So when I asked Lou one time about all these tough guys, these stories of the road, I thought it was fantastic and really entertaining, interesting. We talked to all these guys. And he gave me a little bio of this one, where this happened in Des Moines, this happened wherever. I said, you mentioned all these guys. You never mentioned Hodge. He said, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. You're talking about a different deal here. There's all these tough guys that I wrestle around the world. Japanese guys, Canadians, Australians. Everybody wanted to beat Luthes because they wanted the money that came with that title. He said, well, you're talking about a whole different breed of cat. There's, there's all those guys, and then there's one guy left. That one guy was Hodge, and he was a different than all the rest of them. That's the respect that Dan had. And Dan was an international star, you know. Dan was a, was a big deal in Japan. Major league big deal. So uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of how I look at that uh, with, with Danny. He just he was extraordinary, and 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 it's too bad that so many people. I'm glad they're doing it. Don't get me wrong, but it's unfortunate that we're starting to pay a lot more attention to him in uh, in death than we did uh, in life sometimes. And in his within this world, he was. A god, but his world shrunk over time, and the digital media and all the other things. And you know, I don't know if Danny Hodges' name was 
mentioned on Twitter until he probably passed away. Uh, but it's been a heart, it's been heartwarming to see the outpouring of respect that Dan has gotten, and the fact that many of us have pointed today's fans uh, in that direction. You know, hit YouTube, uh, hit whatever, wherever you can find the video. They're they're everywhere, and watching him wrestle as an amateur or as a pro, and you'll see exactly what I'm, what I'm saying. He's just there's just nobody else like him, and I know I'm biased. I'm an Okie. And I, I, he became my friend, like I said, my mentor, uh, guardian angel. So I'm biased. I fully admit that. Full transparency. I just think they look at the record, look at the time, and, you know, uh, for a guy not to lose any points, I don't know if he, he was even ever taken down. It's, it's unheard of. And if you don't do your, your math and do your research, the stories sometimes are too hard or too, too challenging, too challenging to believe. So anyway, he's a he's a he's the he's the best I ever was ever around. He was so humble and nice. He knew he was like I said, the the wrestlers uh, breathed a sigh of relief knowing that Danny was a good-hearted man. And unless he was really really provoked, he would not hurt you. But if he wanted to hurt you, that's done. And snap the finger. That's how. That's how. That's how he was. So uh, he, he was like a some sort of animal. He could he could beat you and hurt you, and all of a sudden you wonder where'd all that come from. He was a machine, and uh, but he was a thank God he was a good man and humble. I don't think I'd have this career, quite frankly. I've been I'm in three halls of fame and and been making a living doing this stuff since the seventies. Still doing it. Wednesday nights on TNT or all elite wrestling. I would not have this career. Uh, I really truly believe this to be true if it hadn't been for Danny. So if he kept me, it was a tough business to get in, tough business to live through, and to get to a level where you could actually make a living. Prior to Honors Weekend in 2016 down at the Hall of Fame, I came across a Dan Hodge Sports Illustrated on eBay. I had this thing shipped overnight so I could have it because I knew Dan Hodge was going to be at the Hall of Fame. Hodge is the only active wrestler to have appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated. There are situations where we've had MMA fighters who had wrestling backgrounds, but when it comes to that Sports Illustrated, Jim Ross has himself a couple as well. I've got two of those, actually. And he made the frames that both the pictures are in. He, he made them with his hands. He's, you know, he was a, like a woodworking guy. Uh, I can't remember what, his, what the... Uh, Industrial arts, I think maybe a college uh, program, but uh, Danny was just uh, a sweetheart. You know, he when his last book came out, at the book signing when I had one of my restaurants was open. I uh, tried to be there for him as much as I can over the years. Uh, but yeah, he's I got that fifty seven April first, nineteen fifty seven Sports Illustrated, and like I said, the, the finishing touch for me is the fact that he actually made the frames at the he framed them in, so uh, that's a piece of memorabilia that doesn't have a price tag on it. No, I agree with you 100. percent Now, when we look at we, we we look at wrestlers and how they've changed the sport. For example, the college match. You know, Rick Sanders invented the scrambling in the 70s. Ben Askren reinvented it in in the 2000s. We've got we've got active mobile heavyweights where it's not just push and shove. Um, we've had wrestlers transcend and change the sport of collegiate wrestling. When we get into the professional wrestling. How did Dan Hodge change the sport, change the industry, change the business of professional wrestling? Well, he showed that the, a, a fundamental awareness and uh, fundamental knowledge of amateur wrestling was uh, acceptable, and it worked. So if you were, uh, you had some amateur background and he had some training, you can always go back to that in a, in a pro wrestling match to get everything back under control. It's just not all out of out of control, flipping and flopping and, and uh, you know, hitting people with chairs and stuff like that. Uh, just just not. So I think Danny opened the eyes of a lot of guys that trust your wrestling instincts and work them into your routine uh, in the pro ring. And he did that really well. And a lot of guys, you know, were followed suit. I mean, look at all. There's so many names you can name. But all these, there's a lot of pros that made a lot of money that started out as amateurs. And they, they made a transition. Well, they could go, they could go coach wrestling. 
they can go, uh, you know, be a driver's ed teacher. They can do things that uh, a lot of amateurs did, stay in the education field. They're coaching, they're doing what, school seminars, camps. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I looked at it as a smart way of marketing your skills. And you've got these national athletic gifts and you got a good personality that you can, that you can uh, plug into the fact that you can make more money. You know, George Animal Steel was an amateur wrestler, uh, Jim Myers, a football coach. He told me more than one occasion, he'd make more money in the summertime as a pro wrestler. He wrestled a mascot up in the Detroit area and to conceal his identity, but he's, Told me many times he made more money in three months of the of the schools being out of session than he did uh, teaching. So it was a it was a smart move in a lot of guys. Unless your ego was too strong or your pride was too much that you just can't do it. I can't be a pro wrestler. I can't all that fake stuff. And that shows their ignorance because they don't realize these guys do their own stunts. They do it with no off season. You know, God dang, it's just like you're you're not you're looking at this the wrong way. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, that the publicity and things like that were affected. People just didn't want to be associated with it. Thank God that's changed to where now it's, you know, uh, our TV shows in men 18 to 34 is probably one of the uh, most watched cable shows of the week. And it's a pro wrestling show. I don't know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm a little touchy about that because I, I don't understand it, quite frankly. But nonetheless, a lot of people do it. But anybody meeting Danny was a great story for all the sports guys and newspaper guys and all that. His real story about his real athletic life, his life in general, was so extraordinary that it was just too good to pass up. So Dan got a lot of publicity in these towns and markets that he went to because of his amateur background, because they would accept that and sell that as to say, well, he's really a good pro wrestler. Well, I'm not so interested in that. that that's just fake. Okay, so we're not going to get anywhere with this deal. <laughs> okay, so you got your point of view, and I got mine. No big deal. Enjoy your day. So that's kind of how I looked at that stuff. But nobody was like him, man, I'm telling you. He he showed wrestlers that he did to punch and kick and stomp and do all kinds of unbelievable things that just where you make you just want to roll your eyes. Uh, it's not It's not all about that. You can wrestle. Within pro wrestling, and and I work a body part, as they say, and and add as much realism to it as you possibly can. And the thing about it is that all men and women are not created equal, so everybody can't do it the same skill set. Where you really believe there's something going on, there's a fight going on, there's physical physicality going on, because that's how they present themselves. And Danny was a guy that I don't know if he ever hurt anybody. He may have inadvertently, you know, because he's so strong. And he would get all fired up and get goosebumps on. I record tons of them, actually, hundreds of them. He'd get goosebumps on his body, his arms, when the fans start cheering for him because he loved it. That was that that was that was high that you get at in in, in an NCAA tournament when you walk out or you win. Uh, that's that, it's that, ama- that amazing feedback you get from the fans. So, uh, and he loved that. He loved it passionately. So, uh, and some of the wrestlers always got leery when Danny got all geeked up. Well, the crowd's going crazy, coming, you know, trying to get him back in the hunt and fight and get, you know, the bad guy was doing something illegal or whatever. And, uh, and they would be cheering for Danny and he would get so excited that he'd get these goosebumps. And then the other wrestlers would see that and they'd get scared out of their boots because he was so, uh, he, he was so powerful. He could do anything he wanted to do. He could, he could put you in any hole he wanted to have, have you in. It didn't make any difference if you're a 300-pound power lifter. It, it's irrelevant. They all knew. They all respected it. And nobody wanted to cross Danny Hodge. I know you said there's no comparison to Danny Hodge, but if, if there was a wrestler from that 80s and 90s era that, say, the younger generation can maybe identify with, be like, now who would you compare Hodge to or, or, or say, had the best, uh, I guess, wrestled more in, like Hodge, that came through maybe the eighties and nineties that we can, we can compare. Well, Kurt Angle would be the conversation. Also a uh, Bret Hart, Bret the Hitman Hart out of Calgary. Certainly being that he was a former amateur. He would be in that conversation. He, 
he had his fundamental style incorporated a lot of amateur stuff, much like Danny was was uh, illustrating and, and coaching up basically, or demonstrating to the to his peers. So Brett would be one, Kurt Angle would be one for sure. Gosh, I've heard a lot of guys are good. Brock Lesnar can does did it real well. Of course, he was a national champion out of Minnesota. Another that OSU tree of this coach by Jay Robinson. And Jerry Briscoe and I recruited Brock. So he he's really good at using that amateur stuff when he wanted to, what he needed to. It doesn't matter what the audience is buying. You can't sell them something they don't they don't want they don't want to buy. So if they're if they're buying your amateur stuff and you're telling a viable story that's believable, then uh, you're you're good to go. But sometimes they want punching and kicking and chairs over the head and shots and you know woos and all that stuff. It's just a matter of what the audience wants. But generally speaking, when you, you go back to wrestling, fundamentally sound wrestling, a takedown, an arm drag, a single leg, ways to get guys off their feet so you can start, you can continue to manipulate your match. Getting back to what it means to be, as you said, you called yourself an old Okie. You can say that. I can't. Apparently, if you're not from Oklahoma, you can't call somebody an Okie. But if you're from Oklahoma, you can say it. Yeah. What did or what does Dan Hodge mean, not just to wrestling, but to the state of Oklahoma and to you being an Oklahoman? Well, he he makes us all proud to be a fellow Oklahoman like he he was. Uh, you know his accomplishments. Globally, although as we discussed, which have been overlooked by a large pocket of society and a lot of sports fans in general, because the first thing they're going to do is disqualify because he was he was last a pro wrestler. They haven't talked about his boxing career. They haven't talked about his two trips to the Olympics. They haven't talked about any of that. They've talked about winning three national titles, three Big Eight titles. You know, nobody touched him in D one competition. At any level, at any level, he didn't have some number one rival that almost beat him three or four times, or that did beat him. Nobody, nobody. And so that that level of excellence is something I think a lot of uh, uh, us Okies can look look up to, and admire, respect, and appreciate. So uh, you know, he's one of our greatest heroes. There's no doubt about it. I just hope that, unlike Jim, like Jim Thorpe, that our state and the and the and the, and the sports world in general uh, don't forget about that. When it comes to your experiences with Dan Hodge in the business or having a milkshake with him at a diner on the road on the way to Shreveport, what's what's one thing that you're always going to take away from your relationship with him? He looked like secretary. He looked like a racehorse, thoroughbred. Lean, strong, fast, quick, great, amazing balance. I just always be amazed at being in the ring and watching him be athletic. It's, it's a, it was just been watching him a bunch of times. It just never ceased to amaze me how athletic, flexible, strong, strength goes without saying. Uh, he he just he was as strong as he was physically. He was even more soft as a human being. He uh, loved people, loved the fans. He stopped. I never saw him refuse an autograph. I've seen him, you know, hug little kids and grandmas. And everybody loved Danny. He crossed all these demographics. He was a marketer's uh, dream. He touched all the demos. And, and, and they, when you go to a show headlined by Danny Hodge, you're, you're probably going to see a very unique cross-section of folks. Grandma, grandpa, moms and dads, kids, single guys. Uh, everybody had a respect uh, uh, of Danny Hodge or an admiration for him for their own particular reason. But again, as a marketer and a promoter, he checked all the boxes. Uh, Danny gave the people no reason to not like him. He wasn't controversial. You know, he was before, the, as we said earlier, before social media and all these things that were ongoing, are ongoing now. Uh, so, you know, he just, he stayed away from all that controversy. And I, I really, uh, I always consider it a huge honor. I even knew it. I consider I mean, all the drives we've made, the trips, 
relationship with Bill. You know, I was like a little little brother to him. And he took good care of me. So uh, I can, I'll, I know, I thank him so many times it got to be redundant. And he'd just shake his head. He called me Tiger. I don't know why. I have no idea. Tiger, you have to do that. I know you appreciate it. Whatever. But he, that was just him. He's just a sweethearted man. And, uh, and I just, uh, it's just hard to believe it. It took God to beat him. It took God to call him home. For Dan to get him that last time. It wasn't like some, you know, it took it took a, 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 a amazing effort by the good Lord to bring him to heaven. I believe that. So uh, that's how strong he was, how good a person he was. And there's no doubt in my mind that the toughest guy in heaven is right now. No doubt. Lastly, I just want to touch on some of the things about the business now. I mean, obviously, the, the the curtain's been peeled back. It's not as protected as it once was. And you've got crossover appeal, not just going from the collegiate ranks to the prof- you know the world of sports entertainment, professional wrestling, but the biggest movie star in the world right now is The Rock. Where do you see Dan Hodge, if you can get in the DeLorean and the time machine and take him from the 50s, 60s, and 70s and put him into our current world of of professional wrestling, how big of a star would Dan Hodge be today? Well, it all depends. It's like being affiliated with a with a good uh, producer and a good director. And you know, Dwayne, I I, I hired Dwayne back in the day. Uh, Dwayne's been really smart at building his own company around it, uh, and he used that massively large personality and level of charisma. The only downside that Dan may have had is that he was too too humble and too quiet, too polite to uh, pat himself on the back. He wasn't the promoter that uh, The Rock is. Athletically speaking, there's no comparison. The Rock would not wrestle Danny Hodge or you know, anything real, nor would anybody else that I know in professional wrestling today. If they did, they'd do it for the off chance they might get a lucky one in, and that could be to say that they're the guy that beat Hodge in a, in a shoot fight. But uh, The Rock and Danny were different breeds of cat. Danny was a very was a better athlete, but uh, he just didn't have. And that was part of his downfall over the years. If he'd been more extroverted and more uh, charismatic, and uh, then he would probably been more, even more successful. Uh, but he wasn't. He, I don't think he liked. You know the old saying. Uh, he didn't want to break his arm patting himself on the back. That's just Danny. He was a humble Oklahoma kid that got into showbiz and this pro wrestling world. And it was uh, an amazing journey that he, I don't know that he was really prepared for. Even though he, <clears throat> you know, he, he traveled, he was a, just got out of high school and he went to the first Olympics. So but it was a whole different world for him. But the dance, dance downfall compared to The Rock. And look, The Rock is hard to compare anybody to. He's, uh, he's absolutely, uh, Phenomenal vision, creativity, work ethic, all that stuff. The the thing he had, Danny had a great work ethic. Dan knew what his character was going to be and what he wanted to be. He just didn't have the overwhelmingly large charisma uh, to to tell his tale. So, and and that's why he got so much work. He was never a problem for the promoters or uh, all the executives or whatever. He was going to be on time. He was going to do his job. He was going to work hard. And, you know, there you, there you have it. He just, but he's not going to be, that's why he wasn't, he was in a lot of main events, tons and tons and tons of them. He could have been in more if he had a more outgoing personality. But that was just bad. For him to have a more outgoing personality, he would have had to have manufactured it. And that would have made him really phony as a human being. And there's just no way in hell he's going to do that. When I talked to Sergeant Slaughter about um, you know his memories of Hodge, he talked about the car accident and the the injury that pretty much that cut his career short. You know, he did have a, a brief comeback. You know, years later, but how how far how big does does Hodge grow as the television era blooms uh, if he doesn't get into that car accident? Oh, he'd have been a lot bigger, no doubt. But you know, it's hard to say to what level, a higher level, no doubt about it. Uh, it really, uh, 
he really uh, cut things short, you know, for having a broken neck and, and to hold his neck in place and break himself out of his car, which had submerged and getting out of it with his fist, beating, beating the window out, coming back up to the surface, swimming back up with all the broken neck, crawling on his hands and knees to the, up to the, uh, the highway and uh, waiting for somebody to stop and help him. So, uh, that was that was Dan, you know. He was that wasn't he had not selected that way to die, and a lot of people would just give him up and drown because he was an amazing. You got to only imagine what kind of pain he was in. It was pretty, uh, I would think, very substantial to navigate a broken neck. So, yeah, it's, his career would have been it was cut short. You know, he's even after that, I saw him and he was he was happy, and he told he loved telling the stories. He he loved the fact he was an Oklahoma kid that, you know, knew how to order Japanese food or, or you know, he had all these experiences traveling and wrestling. So uh, he looked at his career as a big blessing and never looked at it as where, well, poor me. Uh, I could have been so much better if I had this wreck. I've never heard him say that one time. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Sportswear. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. Hey, you know what? Did you like the show? You want to hit that subscribe button? MattTalkOnline.com slash listen. Various different ways to subscribe to this show on your favorite podcatcher of choice. And if you're already subscribed, you're already listening, you love the show, and you want to support this show and this network, MattTalkOnline.com slash join the team. Become a team member today.